Welcome to the Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies to dive headfirst into some nostalgia or just get a little creative. So every month we select a different topic and create a top three list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Screen Refresh or shoot an email at screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know your top three or suggest future topics. I'm your host, Dave... I'm your, that screwed me up because I'm your host, Nick. <laughs> well, I wrote it for myself. <laughs> oh, shit. That means you have to be David. Wait, no. <laughs> oh, wait. No, that's Tim. Mm. I'm your host, David, and I'm joined this week with Tim and Nick. They know us. Hello there. David, how does it feel to be holding the reins on Roll of Thirds today? Um, It's a little strange. A little, a little interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm slowly transitioning for the, hey, I'm here every so often to being like, hey, you've got nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you watch it, it's like, oh, guest starring. Then eventually it's like, oh, recurring character. Oh, main cast. Uh, it's like there's a, a podcast that my partner listens to that is um, uh, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. And their first season, which I mean, their season was literally them going over every book. So it's like a three year season. Um, <laughs> they went from having a, a guest star to now in the new season. He's just what he's just the second host now. Nice. Yeah, I feel like in our opening credits, it was no longer guest starring David. Now it's just and David. <laughs> It's always interesting, especially when you see things that go on for a long period of time and you get so used to some people that come in in later seasons that it's weird to think about, oh, yeah, that's right. In season one, they weren't there. I think immediately it's like Parks and Rec. I'm just getting rid of words in the staffing. Like Nick was saying, it was just like guest host, get rid of guest host. Soon it'll just be David. Or just <laughs> me, me for like 30 minutes, just like talking about what I want. <laughs> <laughs> well the opening it'll go from like welcome back to um where we take a little break and welcome to their show to our show to my show <laughs> so it's really it's really hostile i'm you know we may be separated by several states but uh there's a full physical uh aggressive threat going on <laughs> currently constantly <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see a hostile virtual takeover. It's just like memes of weapons I send you constantly. <laughs> so, David, why are we here tonight? Uh, so we're here tonight because I think we're talking about our favorite action set pieces. Now, what is an action set piece? So that's kind of a good question. What <laughs> is an action I set know. piece? <laughs> I had to Google it myself because I'm like, well, I know what an action is, like action scene is, but what's the difference between an action scene and an action set piece? It, it, yeah. it is one of those phrases you always hear referred to as like, oh, it's a great set piece. And then it's stopping to think like, what exactly does that mean, though? It's like, oh, it's just a scene or collection of scenes that make up the overall like segment from there i always like to think of it as the things that are in the uncharted games <laughs> i mean essentially yes <laughs> it's just uncharted it's like oh what's that it just goes set piece to set piece that's all those games are i mean they're great but um but yeah it really is kind of uh kind of nebulous at times it's it's a little i find it a little hard to define but it really is those like central action points that our entire stories centered around specific places or objects um, that happen to have these like grand action storytelling. Yeah. Like I can think of something like the dark Knight when it opens the whole heist scene and then the, um, mm -hmm. the bus leaving. It's like, okay, so is the, there could be the scene just in the bank lobby, but then you include like whatever's going on, on the roof and then the whole going to the bus thing. And it's like, okay, so overall entirely, it's a set piece because as soon as that's done, it goes into whatever the next scene is. So it's like, it's a collection of scenes that serve the purpose of building that overall like segment of the film, um, that all is cohesively together. Yeah, like another would, good one. Think. And I hope it's none of y'all's picks is like, um, oh, don't say the big shootout scene in the matrix, oh, okay. Neo and oh, Trinity mm -hmm. walk classic. into the building and, 
He goes through the metal detector, and then it's just that one massive action sequence starting from there, and then ending with them like, um, like smashing the helicopter into the building. Like that entire thing is just a constant like edge of your seat action piece, and it was definitely way ahead of its time because uh, plenty of it has been parodied constantly ever since it was made. But that's just for the individual scenes and the stuff yeah. that just the Matrix is known for in general. Oh yeah, address, the rest, but yeah, the Ma- the Matrix set the bar on action sequences, and that lobby shootout is still one of the greatest action like scenes in mm-hmm. cinema. Like, and and scene that was nearly terribly messed up when uh, Keanu Reeves accidentally tripped and the small explosives that they had planted in the pillars, uh, they had very, very limited number of shots they could do. Um, there, there's a specific scene where he does a cartwheel and picks up, uh, it's like an M16 that he goes to shoot. And there's a specific scene where they set off the miniature charges in the uh, one of the pillars. Uh, and they only had like they only had so many there was like budget constraints and the first time they shot it and they only had two chances and the first time they shot it like they did the cartwheel thing where he was on wires and he actually trips and falls and they blow the pillar because it's all timed <laughs> they're like all right well we've got one more shot at this i guess <laughs> it reminds me of like in tropic thunder where they have like the most expensive line of pyrotechnics like ready and set up they only got one shot at it and then the guy thinks that uh, the director said, you know, go, go, go. So he kicks it off and the whole explosion goes off when it was really shouldn't have. So I actually, when we get to mine, um, it is along those lines of we have a very small window to hit this in, um, mm-hmm. which I think makes a lot of these even more impressive when it has all of these tight constraints. Because, I mean, realistically, a lot of these set pieces budgetary reasons timing reasons like all of the moving parts involved in it it's not something that it's like a uh, two people at a table having a conversation or it's not like heat where they could have de niro and pacino at a table and it's like okay we do 50 takes until you guys get this perfect it's no we have 15 helicopters in the air we have a hundred million dollars of pyrotechnics going um we have to kill three extras every single time we shoot this (laughs) So it kind of reminds me of like when um with Oppenheimer coming out recently and um Nolan was congratulated with using the least amount of special effects as possible being able to recreate the atom bomb without actually setting one off was like how did you do that but it reminds me of when he shot the dark knight again and during the action set piece again but this time with the joker and um he's driving that big 18 wheeler and they actually flipped it and it was actually done. Makes you wonder like how many times did they actually have that opportunity to do that? So I think during this sequence or the one immediately before it, when he's on the bat pod, I think at one of those takes, they accidentally destroyed the camera that they were using. And that was like one of two IMAX cameras in the world. And it was destroyed during the filming of that. I'm glad they made more. Yeah, so you can keep making. I think it's at this point it's just like Christopher Nolan's cameras. Because every time they make more, it's because he needs them. Actually, that would be ridiculous if every time any other movie wants to shoot on IMAX, they have to go sign a sheet and rent them out from Christopher Nolan. Just imagine the sign out sheet at this point. It's just Christopher Nolan's name going down like five pages worth of stuff. It's like a, a library like card that's in the the book jacket. Yeah. <laughs> Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan. James Cameron, Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what order we want to go in. David, as host of this episode, do you want to go last? Do you want to round it up? Um, I think I'll go first, actually, because oh. I think I have. I might have one of the more contentious picks. Oh, I thought you were going to be like, I have other stuff to do, so let me go first. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm just going to drop wrap out. This like, up. I'm just going to say my thing. And the back half leave. of the episode will be an AI voice. <laughs> um, no, when I was when I was looking at set pieces, I, uh, you know, I had some criteria in mind. And then I was like, oh, but this. And I'm like, well, this this is hmm, this doesn't really hit some of the criteria. Maybe too much. But so anyway, my set piece pick uh, is the sequence or series of scenes 
uh, that makes up the sequence for the Helm's Deep battle in Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Oh, hell yeah. So it begins. Fell deeds awake. Now for wrath. Now for ruin. And the red dawn. I'm saying maybe contentious because it's like a 40 minute sequence which <laughs> i'm like maybe a little long for an action set piece but like it's action that's focused around a particular place and thing i am always hard pressed to remember that there's the rest of the movie other than the battle of helm's deep and i'm like oh yeah don't they have the whole like you are not welcome here or whatever it is and then it goes right back to the Battle of Helm's Deep. I'm like, oh, wasn't there still another like two hours to that film? It was the last third. Yeah, yeah. It was. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's it's most of the movie, honestly. Um, but it's yeah. so funny when you watch it. It doesn't necessarily feel like that. I mean, the Battle of Helm's Deep, I, I feel is is not just iconic for the Lord of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but like it's iconic for medieval fantasy battles in cinema. Um, I can't think of a, a even a more recent one that can compare to it. I mean, at the time, the Battle of Helm's Deep was a feat of casting, practical effects, and special effects. Um, I, me- I remember reading that for the Battle of Helm's Deep, they actually created some of their own uh, CGI software, um, where they they created the software that could. Uh, do that basically like duplication process with like random fill in um computer yeah, generated like a, actors like an army builder yeah essentially i, I forget what it's called it's, it's like massive something it has an acronym <laughs> what um, every because, 3d anime post 2015 has been using since then i mean essentially because at the scene they they i remember the the casting director um i'm trying to remember her name oh uh, liz Mullane. she was saying that they had around a thousand uh, extras extras and stunt actors uh for the actual scenes um but clearly they made it look much much larger with you know technology that they invented which is one of the coolest things uh when you're really trying to to push what you're able to do in cinema is, is invent, inventing the technology you need to, to create the scenes and the battle of helms Eep, it took around four months to do the whole filming um c- clearly they had the budget to kind of do whatever they needed to do um but yeah it's it's an incredible it's an incredible like sequence um you know the there's a lot of stories and you know uh in the behind the scenes footage uh, behind the scenes and like documentaries behind it um they talk about how the stunt actors like were notorious for going like full speed like in the action sequences <laughs> there was no pulling of punches like what a workshop constantly talked about how they would every day make hundreds of repairs on the swords and armor that were just that were real swords and real armor it was just blunted wasn't there the other story about john reese davies that they were like yeah. okay there's padding or whatever it is but just try to be careful and he just would thwack them full force every single time oh yeah yeah, and there was stories of the stuntman where they they loved going up against Vigo Mortensen and all of their scenes with him because he was one of the only actors that gave it back to them as much as they would. So like they'd go into scenes with Vigo Mortensen and they were having real fights. <laughs> like yeah, they were scripted choreographed fights, but they were real. <laughs> all of the behind the scenes stuff for Lord of the Rings, if no one's ever seen it, you know, there's like um the The extended editions usually come with like a bonus DVD or Blu-ray, and it's just a three-hour documentary on how they made it. And between all of the cast and crew interviews that are in each movie, it's 100% worth watching it, even just for that. You don't even have to watch the movie. Just watching the interactions and the interviews of the actors talking about how like 
you know, John Reese Davis would go up and it's like, all right, I want you to attack me from here. Then you were going to come over here. And he's going to beat the shit out of every single one of those stuntmen that comes running toward him with an axe. <laughs> he is going to give it right back. And it's oh, always yeah. it's- so cool to hear like, you know, they're doing each other's accents and just reliving the stories. You can tell on how proud they were of making everything from start to finish with that trilogy. And Whoever decided let's let's document this in like full, complete, intimate exposure and like really getting behind the scenes and way more than most other movies do. They're a genius idea and it really shows in the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, it, it's it's cool seeing, you know, both the actors talking about it and some of the construction, like seeing that the Helm's Deep cast like fortress was, you know, built in a quarry uh for the close up scenes, and then they also had a 30 meter miniature for some of the wide scenes uh and just seeing how that was built uh just like inside this quarry and like talking about like the artificial rain and the natural rain that they had to work in and you know the morale of the extras trying to like stay positive and like singing in between scenes uh it was funny that one one kind of ad-libbed a uh, morale booster that the extras were using in between scenes was actually included in the film when cocaine. <laughs> um, at the, before the the Urukai charge, like when they're like stamping like their spears into the ground, like that's just something the extras were just kind of doing. Like they were just like hanging out, like in between scenes, and they were just like banging their spears against the ground to like. That's just that's terrifying. Yeah, they were just like like half bored, half I don't know, trying to keep themselves awake, working fourteen hour like fourteen hour days exclusively at night. Uh, and the the second unit director just liked it so much. He was like, "Yeah, we should do that. That'd be that'd be cool." <laughs> uh, and just like some of the 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 kind of natural, um, not like hatred, but like competitiveness that came up in the, the filming between the actors playing the Urukai and the actors playing the elves, um, just kind of like started to evolve and kind of spiral out of control a little bit. <laughs> it's, it's kind of awesome though. Where, where like it's the, so cool. the, the Urukai actors were all, uh, like locals, like to New Zealand. And they're all like, you know, they found like really muscular, large guys, uh, to play them. But the elves were mostly college kids where they were just like, Hey, we just need like, tall slightly skinny people like we have way less constraints on what we're looking for in terms of like body type um so you had like the urukai played by like veteran um stunt actors and then just like college kids as the elves <laughs> and then there, there started like this brew this little bit of competitiveness uh where like you had veteran actors who did stunts and did stuff and like kids who had to be shown how to do everything um and they they started to get into their own like little little tiffs and name callings and stuff which was i don't know it was kind of funny and and kind of played up a little bit in the actual filming uh which is it's cool to see how that kind of develops um but i think with something that large and that immersive there has to be stuff like that that just organically starts to happen as time goes mm-hmm. on just because it's it's not like a nine to five it's at that point you're just living breathing like existing in these characters in these costumes in this oh, yeah. location like going 14 hours a day for four months like you just are that person now yeah i still think it's a testament to the the action sequence overall just for the fact that like you mentioned it's like 40 minutes long but like mm-hmm. you said it doesn't feel that long it takes up a chunk of the movie without really feeling like it is this kind of looming presence over the runtime of the film. And that kind of action sequence too was edited in such a way that action sequences are difficult to shoot for a long period of time because after a while you get bored because it's just Mm -hmm. more fighting, more fighting. How many more different angles from new things that are happening in the battlefield? That's like, it, it changes it up and it's not the consistent same thing through that entire 40 minutes. So even though we're not in the front line anymore and now we're in like the back room with Thade and King, you know the Orakai are literally right on the other side of that door ready to like come through and you never left the battle. It's just you're in a different part of it or 
you know, they go into the um, uh, where the like the women and children are being held. It cuts to that in a way that it's just cinematically shot in such a way that it never gets stale through that entire segment is of it award winning within itself. And it, I don't think is uh, acknowledged just as much even when it should be. Mm. I also like that Nick still paid his respects to Theoden King. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so that's my pick. Um, the extremely elaborate and very, very, you know, very long third of a movie action set piece. Who would have thought Lord of the Rings would fall on the list of good action set pieces? <laughs> I mean, when you basically have a blank check to create a beloved fantasy movie, it's amazing <laughs> what you can get done. Especially when you do it right. Yeah. So who would like to go next? Um, Nicholas, now that you're back, if you'd like, I can go next so you can be the closer, unless you'd prefer to be the middle. So my pick is okay. the return to Shadow Moses from Metal Gear Solid 4. Metal Gear. Yeah, Metal Gear Solid 4. I, th I forget what act it is. I think it's Act 4. Maybe it's Act 3. I don't remember. I, you know, it's Act 4. The return to Shadow Moses Island, and from start to finish, it's just a complete it's like getting hit with a train of nostalgia from the very beginning of the entire sequence to the very end. So as you're going through, you know, you're returning to the site of the first original Metal Gear Solid one, and you're um, almost retracing your steps. It plays music cues in the same way that it did in the original game. You get to see some of the original things that you did and like you get constant flashbacks to back when the original game because you're playing as the same guy that did it. So, you know, Solid Snake is going through his PTSD of remembering like, oh, this is the tank that I fought and, you know, this is the tank hangar that the tank was in and, you know, Metal Gear and all the other things that happened throughout the entirety of the uh, franchise. So... Going through that entire thing was like uh, just a huge treat in my eyes to be able to re like experience once again in a new light, having a like I, I forget the time frame between when Metal Gear One came out versus when uh, Metal Gear Four did. But then at the very end, you know, um, you climb into the destroyed Metal Gear that you destroyed in the first game, and you get to drive it. And then you have this big kaiju style battle with the newer Metal Gear Destroyer. I don't. Oh, Metal Gear Ray. That's what it was. And you're doing like a one on one fight with it. And it's like a Godzilla style, you know, kaiju battle, which was amazing. And just from start to finish, that entire segment was just always stood out so much in my head that, you know, Metal Gear 4 doesn't get a lot of credit. And I understand that a lot of it is just. It's like a 10 hour cutscene in some cases like that, but that entire sequence in itself, like being a long term Metal Gear Solid fan, that is everything that I could have hoped for in closing out Solid Snake's story. And nowadays it all seems to be focused on Big Boss and Naked Snake, whatever you want to call him, and Demon Snake or whatever the thing from Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain that he is currently now, but you know, my snake was always Solid Snake, and this chapter and uh, game entirely was like, this is my fix in the whole Metal Gear franchise, and this one loved it from start to finish. Now, yeah, I, I remember playing Metal Gear Four, um, and I was I was lukewarm on it at the time. Uh, I think partially because that 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 note you mentioned, where it was like twenty minutes of gameplay and then an hour of cutscenes yeah and that was kind of like repeated over and over again for the full like 40 hour ish playthrough yep um but that sequence of the return of shadow Moses was amazing like doing the flat like playing the flashbacks a surveillance camera. yep um though my biggest takeaway from that though was that it's like man i really want a remake of metal gear solid <laughs> That, yeah. I remember that being like my prevailing thought of like, oh, I'd love to see a remake of this. I mean, they did they did do a remake on GameCube yep. that updated some things. Was that Twin Snakes? Uh, which, which was great. Yeah. Um, but it really made me like want to play those sequences again with like updated like mechanics and you know quality of life stuff. Um, but yeah, that that whole sequence was by far the best part of the game, 
And, you know, like you were saying, I had, I was following the Metal Gear Solid series for a while, at least one through four. Um, I kind of fell off after four, but like having that same path of like really, really intensely loving the first Metal Gear Solid game and playing it f way too many times. Um, and then four felt finally like we had the capstone to that story. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I would have liked to probably seen that sooner in the series. I feel like we kind of moved around in the storyline a lot before that kind of happened. And we got to see the, the, the finish to that. It almost is like watching star Wars in the machete order. Hmm. Because you start with Metal Gear 1 and then Metal Gear 2 and then out of nowhere you get transported back to the very beginning and you see the origins of Big Boss and it has nothing to do with Metal Gear Solid from what you've seen and experienced because this is not Solid Snake even though the character looks and sounds exactly like him. Yeah. And then once you beat that then you flash forward again and this time you're back to being Old Snake or Solid Snake but now he's much older and... It's this is the different character that you played from three, and it's the same one that you played in one and two, and it's just kind of weird. It's just like, what's going on here? And ever since, it seems like they've been focusing more on going back to three. And I know that's the next game that's going to get uh, remade, and that one I am kind of excited for. But at least for Solid Snake's era of stuff, this one was just. I mean, there's no other game that I've ever played that had as many Easter eggs in it compared to Metal Gear One. Hmm. so many of the little things that you can do that you may not even realize that can also either make the game a lot easier for you or just it had more innovative stuff in it that some games you kind of take for granted and you expect them to be in there now back then you wouldn't have thought that you know if i got the dog to pee on the cardboard box i can use that cardboard box and then go through the like the aggressive wolf area and not get attacked like that's not something that anyone's ever thought of or like hey if i get in a cardboard box that says to the heliport and i get in a moving truck but i happen to be in the weapon the nuclear arms facility warehouse that truck will bring me to the heliport i didn't know that that's amazing you know like that's no other game was like that at the time and at most we had stuff like super mario so this is one of the most advanced games to come out and one of the first and most advanced games to come out. So it was such a huge impact on our lives at that point in time. Like now it's hard to, now it's kind of hard to watch and play that game now with everything else that's come out since. But at the time, man, like that was a huge deal. So being able to go back to Shadow Moses and almost looking at it in the same way that Old Snake is at that point in time, that's why it like hits you right in the nostalgia, you know? Like, I think that's one of the best things about Kojima's direction in his games is that he does always include these kind of quirky narratives and like, like narrative mechanics sometimes too, like with the uh, hiding in a certain marked box and like going into a truck. Like even thinking about like, you know, the original Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid, you had like the fun narrative of like, oh, you have to get the bottle of ketchup item. So when you get put into a jail cell, you can break it and use it to imitate blood. So then the guard comes in and thinks you died. That's mentioned like, or like um, Psycho Mantis. You actually have to unplug the controller from the first controller port and put it in the second one because he's able to read your mind when it's plugged into the first controller like mind blown being our 10 year old selves like mm -hmm. what other game has done this nothing or the nothing. Uh, that old sniper in three where it's just if you save your game and then just come back to it like a year later he'll just be dead from old age <laughs> you know yeah. I, I actually did that unintentionally <laughs> i got to his boss fight i got the game for christmas i played it up to that point in time i couldn't beat him i got frustrated and i'm like you know what fuck it i'm done i'm not gonna play it anymore picked it up the following christmas <laughs> and then when i load it into the game it's like he kills over dead like wait what <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, that's just like the classic Kojima direction. And it's it's so cool and it's so refreshing that he, he does. He adds all of these strange little quirks um, that you really don't expect. I remember in Metal Gear Solid 2, um, towards the end when, I guess, spoiler alert, when, when Raiden uh, or Raiden connects with Snake again at the end, like before they have like the big like infinite Metal Gear Ray fight 
And Raiden says to Snake, like, oh, are you going to be okay out there? And Snake points to his headband and says, don't worry, infinite ammo. <laughs> <laughs> which was which was from the, uh, when Metal Gear Solid 1, one of the endings would get you a headband item that would give you infinite ammo. Um, and it's just, it's just weird things like that, that, that he just includes and, and like turns into like narrative canon where it's just like, oh, okay. I remember. So like, I knew you guys came in off the first, or well, the Metal Gear Solid, um, the first solid game, but I came in off too. So my point of entry into the series was always as Raiden and it was like, oh, and this guest star snake. So that was always so when he pops back up in like four and whatnot, because is the the rehash of Shadow Moses, is that the sequence that ends with Raiden like stopping the Metal yeah. Gear with the sword? Yep. So that was all the stuff that I thought like it's cool because you get the nostalgia of oh, Solid Snake is back, and then I get the nostalgia of like, oh man, Raiden. A lot of stuff happened to this guy. Don't get me wrong, though. I remember explicitly having sleepovers at David's house, bringing the Metal Gear Solid 2 demo, and us playing that all night. There's like oh, yeah. 15, 20 minutes worth of content on that disc. We made it last. I know. I we remember even the hell out of it. Even speculating about which ending was canon for Metal Gear Solid 1 because Snake shows up in the beginning with the camouflage cloak. Mm-hmm. And you only got the camo cloak as a special item if you finished the game with Meryl being alive, I think. No, dead. I was dead. And infinite ammo was if she was alive. Yep. So then, like, when you get to the end of it, it's like, oh, okay, I guess they didn't choose which ending was canon <laughs> if Meryl was alive or not. So ultimately, I think they need to do a a remake of 4 and just update it for quality of life and graphics because the so lead did. up to the fist fight is that is so simple, but such a great action sequence in itself. Oh, the ending for four? Yeah, the mm. the just straight slugfest duel, and it just keeps changing like the music and everything as you go through. I would love, even... I'd, I'd love to see them give that treatment to the fist fight you have in one with Liquid Snake. Yeah. Um, the, because at the, um, the end of one, you, you're having a fist fight with Liquid on top of the destroyed Metal Gear Rex. And I'm sure that's where they drew inspiration for the ending. Um, for me, the Metal Gear, the, the fist fight with Liquid was a, a bit more narratively intense, but uh, a cool the sequence in four. Scene before that. Oh, yeah. Because you have to like just spam X to keep crawling forward. And that was probably one of the worst instances where you had to spam a button in any video game because it got to the point where, like, it was bad. And it almost gave you that same perspective of, like, it's almost impossible to, you know, beat that sequence because of how much you have to spam the X button. But at the same time, seeing what's going on, you know, the, um, like, the enemy is just raining artillery down on the neighboring ships that's trying to attack whatever the hell it's called arsenal gear outer heaven thing you know the ship that snakes on you know the bad guys is basically winning at this point while it's cutting into seeing snake crawl through that radioactive hallway and his suit is getting all ripped up from all of the radioactive damage and his face is getting all messed up from the um the heat and everything else that's going on with it so getting to that point and you're physically exhausted from just pressing that damn button and then on top of that snake is exhausted and now you have to do a fist fight on top of uh um on the highest point of that ship was definitely another huge set piece of just memorable video game history let alone just it being action sequence yeah yeah (laughs) yeah give us one more metal gear metal gear (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so, tim what is your your action set piece so my action set piece might be metal gear some <laughs> the, the original from, metal from, gear. Son, from sonic adventures one <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that everybody might be familiar with is probably getting familiar with only because of the the new release um but the the year is 2011 and ethan hunt and his spy team need to access a server um, up at the top of the Burj Khalifa building 
and they are on floor 123 of 130. And this is when Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 4 Ghost Protocol actually climbs the Burj Khalifa. Um, That whole sequence of him leaving one of the floors and like climbing up using like the the uh, electronic suction gloves, the prototype tools that he's given. And as he's climbing up, like the glove gives out and he loses one glove and he's continuing to climb and he's trying to use his laser cutter and cut into the server room and get through the glass. And then he drops that. And then he has to hold one arm to the wall as he tries to kick his way through the rest of the glass. And at this point, he finally gets through. He's inside the server room. But he, once he does everything with the server, he now needs to get back to the room that he escaped from. And then as he's going, he ends up kind of doing a diehard, throwing the, uh, I think it was like the fire, ex- the fire hose or something out the window, and he's trapezing down, uh, or rappelling down, and realizes that he doesn't have enough cord. No. No shit. So he runs along one side of the building, does like a swan dive out towards the opening, and then just leaps through the air um, while Jeremy Renner, in the strongest pair of slacks known to man, uh, ends up grabbing him as, uh, I think it was Paula Patton, grabs him, and they daisy-chain Tom Cruise back into the building. So it was amazing because Tom Cruise did this as a stunt. Um, Granted, he had harnesses and things like that in real life, but that was him. They actually, I guess, ended up having to put in all of these different, um, like, mounting systems and things like that. They destroyed, I think it was like 26 windows in the building, having to set up all of this stuff. The harness that he had on was cutting off circulation, so he was, like, losing feeling in his extremities down below the waist. So it was making it harder for him to continue doing this stunt. And the film that they shot this on for the IMAX only allowed them to do this for a very limited amount of time. Plus, because they were doing this at the Burj Khalifa, the helicopters filming this only were allowed to be in the air for 30 minutes. So all of this had to be like practice, 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 practice on the like fake glass walls. Get it as perfect as we can using all of these conditions and now go up and do this for real because we only have like one or a handful of takes to be able to get this entire thing. I watched it on YouTube earlier when I was thinking about it, and even that still gives me, like, my palms get sweaty on 720p. You can pay me no amount of money to do those stunts in real I mean, life. He does make a lot of, he makes a lot of money from these movies. I know, though. but I mean, it's what's the point of, like, it's $50 billion if you're dead? Well, I truly respect his mindset. Like, granted, sure, it might be a some kind of ego-based death wish of... I need to be the best. I need to do the best. But also I like his mindset of I am a movie star. People are going to pay $15 to come watch me and just be amazed and like leave talking to their friends about, oh my God, how cool was that? So let's give them their money's worth. Like let's do everything we can to make this as like cool an experience as possible. And I got to respect that. Yeah, I get, I get, I get that somewhat. I mean, I'm trying to remember, I was listening to an interview and I, I don't want to misquote it because I think it was Simon Pegg, but I might be I might be off. Um, but he was talking about how actors who want to do their own stunts sometimes feel selfish because if the actor gets hurt, like let's say Tom Cruise did that and he broke his ankle, like that just shuts down the movie for like eight weeks. Which yeah, like I remember I think the Danny Trejo was talking about it one time where they asked him I think it was Machete. Of like, oh, did you do your own stunts in Machete? And he was like, no, I don't do my own stunts. He's like, there are stuntmen for that. There are people who train and practice and their entire life is doing stunts because I want to show off and I get hurt. And now I put all these people out of work yeah. because, oh, but look at me. Um, so, like, I get that, too. Um, yeah. And I mean, and I, I get I get the other perspective because, like. If if I was an actor and I did action movies, I would I'd be like, yeah, I want to do my own action sequences. I'd you know, I'm thinking about like, um, but David, uh, there's a fine line between <laughs> us choreographing a fight scene and like, you know, me picking you up and like slamming you through it like a fake table. 
I know, versus but like, suspending put, put, you like a mile in the air, suctioning up uh, to the side so of the So putting you in a so Toyota not, Corolla so, with a jet and launching <laughs> you into orbit. So not Tom, not Tom Cruise action sequences. I'm thinking like Marvel. Like if you were in yeah. Marvel Civil War, right? And you were, um, I'm spacing on Captain America's, the actor's name. Chris yeah, Evans. like the fights with him and yeah. like. Um, and I'm like, I want to do the cool knife fight scene. Like, yeah. Come on. <laughs> I feel like that'd be a blast. Yeah, those scenes do make a lot more sense. But the extreme shit that Tom Cruise keeps pulling off, like <laughs> uh, it's it's not well, only he's not even an actor anymore. He's like the producer and he's one of the main drivers to this movie. If he dies, the franchise dies with him. I don't yeah. think they'll make more after so, he's dead. Oh, yeah. To prove and, and how like, ridiculous Tom Cruise is, I like how you guys just said, like, well, no, 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 not like a Tom Cruise stunts, something like Marvel superheroes. <laughs> 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 you know, Marvel superheroes, a step down from Tom Cruise. <laughs> I, I love, uh, if you've ever seen the uh, YouTube series, it's, um, oh, crap, it's something Corridor. Um, Corridor Crew? I think I think it might be where they're they're a, yeah. a VFX they're special team. Special effects yep. guys. Yeah. Yeah. Where they so they do uh, occasionally they do episodes where like they sit down with another VFX person and they look at VFX from movies, um, but they also do it with stunt coordinators. Yeah. Where they'll sit down and look at movies and like they'll talk about the stunts. And I remember they brought in the stunt coordinator from Civil War, and like talking through like how some of the stunt sequences work, and like those stuntmen like they do get hurt like seriously hurt um oh, yeah. there there's a, a sequence in um in captain america winter soldier where uh i think uh captain america is like knocked into like a car door but he like has the shield arranged away where he's fine and he's like oh no like i broke four ribs like i was after that after we got that shot i was i was i was done in the movie <laughs> and it's just like thinking about like oh yeah if chris evans did that scene like yeah, he would have been he would have been done for a while and production would have halted and like it would have been awful. Yeah. God, what I watched something the other day and they were talking about the stunt guy and that's basically the same exact thing happened. He ended up like the whole stunt was just he had a fall from like somewhere high up and he just landed like belly flop right on the ground and it was maybe at least a 10 foot drop, but that was enough like the guy cracked all his ribs. And that was the take of course and that's always like one of the that's always one of the the rules in Hollywood. Like you always got to use that take almost like out of respect, yeah. just like you injured yourself. We'll make sure that's the one that goes in. And that was the one. And it's just, when you see the guy just land flat on the ground like that, it's just like, Oh man, that's but like, well, cause it's, it's kind of, it, it's kind of funny. Cause like, that's also the scene where they didn't have to sell it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It looks kind of fake. Like, no, he, he, he almost died here. It's like the old thing of like um, Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber. And it's like, yeah, he actually had a back injury. So when they released him from that, uh, was it the the harness for the drop at the end of the movie? That's actual pain on his face. <laughs> but also, like, how do you ha like, how do you feel as a director to do some of the action sequences and have to tell a stuntman, like, let's do one more take. And that's the one they get hurt on. And they'll like, if I just kept it to the one that we did and just used it, like if it's so much better, I'm sure the stunt man, depending on the injury would probably just say like, this is why I do it. Like, this is the best take. But when it's like marginally different or it's like maybe worse, it's, ah, I just hurt a guy and put him out of work because eh. that's why yeah. they have to cast Tom Cruise and everything. <laughs> He just does all of it. Well, I mean, I remember uh, like reading or watching behind the scenes things with like Jackie Chan, who was notorious for always doing his own stunts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but his stunts are like amazing, though. Well, I mean, Tom Cruise's are amazing. Yeah, but I think uh, also well, Jack Jackie's is like more choreography done. Oh, um, that's true. Perfectly well. Right, and like doing a acrobatics, but like Jackie Chan originally trained as a gymnast, like <laughs> so, like it's it's it it's natural to him um, to do that. Eh, I don't know what point I'm trying to make with that, but like Jackie, like Jackie Chan in another time would have been a stunt coordinator, 
Like oh, yeah. he just he just happened to to get himself in a place where he also was allowed to act. Which I think also everybody talks about how amazing his stunts are just in general because of all of his work. But then he talks about all of the actual injuries he sustained over mm-hmm. the years. And he's like, yeah, I have like a permanent hole in my skull. Like I can't like feel Didn't three fingers and literally break every single bone in his body. I think yeah, so. I, I had a an old uh, like uh, Disney magazine when I was a kid that like it was talking. I can't I think it was talking about um, oh the Jack Chan movie with uh, Chris Tucker. Um, rush hour yeah rush hour uh i think it was just coming out and like they did a whole article with jackie chan and they had a diagram of jackie chan's body with like pointing at all of the injuries he's had <laughs> it's on just his a body. human skeleton with an x over it oh no it was it was it was it was, it was jackie chan basically like t-posing in a shot and they just had like <laughs> arrows pointing at all of the things that have happened to him and like i remember my favorite was like it was like his he, he electrocuted his eye socket <laughs> I mean, <laughs> amazing. He's still able to walk. I know. So thank you for everything, Jackie Chan. <laughs> going to go watch uh police story and rumble in the Bronx now. Oh, so there's so many good ones. So many. I rewatched Operation Condor like rush hour recently and it still holds up. I, I went back and rewatched the trilogy and I didn't care for the first one as much as I did growing up, but I liked the second and third more than I did. Cause I think it probably was just because all, a lot of the humor in the first movie was more like kind of racist antagonism between the two of them. Cause they weren't friends yet in the film and then they get friends over time. So the first one just always was like, okay like sure yeah I'm sure we'll that's cover it true. eventually that that's that early 90s writing <laughs> we always end up quoting the outtakes too we waste all our film best bloopers of all time his name is lee damn it he ain't gonna be in rush hour three i still that's the first thing that comes to mind whenever i see like a character like take a fall off a building or like have a horrible death i'm just thinking like he ain't gonna be in rush hour three <laughs> So, yes, uh, my choice is Mission Impossible 4, Ghost Protocol, the Burj Khalifa sequence. I mean, it's a good sequence. It's also, you know, it's funny I didn't think about Mission Impossible when thinking about set pieces because it's notorious for them. Oh, yeah. Every movie has, like, some really cool, amazing sequence to it. Oh, absolutely. Like, even going back to the first one. I mean, the first one wasn't as intense, but, like, it has, it still has the iconic, like, suspension line like yeah you know when he suddenly drops and like spreads out his body like an inch from the floor like it's so iconic when it comes to like Shyamalan and how every movie he makes you're expecting there to be another bigger better twist Mm. and I feel Mission Impossible is the only example where they set a standard you're expecting to see it again and they're the only ones to have successfully built up and did something more and more impressive with every single movie which i like how it's not necessarily like we have to keep topping the bar every time because like yeah sure there's certain ones where they top the previous bar but also it's like we're going to do something cool but we're going to do something different every time it's not just oh he climbed 120 stories now 150 now 200 it's like okay and this one he's going to he's like uh, i think two opens up with him just like free climbing up a mountainside um, and then I forget what the, the sequence in three was, but then, yeah, like the sequence in four, I think in the later ones, he does like the, um, the drop from what was ever it was like the plane or something like that and climbs on the side of a plane. So it's always something that isn't necessarily like a, a one-upmanship, but it's just like, oh, I can remember which movie it is by the action sequence that set it apart. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Whereas like other comparisons would be like, you know, oh, the Daredevil hallway fight. It's like, well, we're on Daredevil season six now. Get ready for a hallway fight with a hallway that's as long as the runway from Fast and the Furious. You know, like, enough. Like, you did it great. <laughs> you made a great set piece. You did something very unique. But can we move on and do something different this time instead of just revisiting the same trope that you've created? It's not. 
unique that, or interesting anymore. That should be an episode. Favorite long takes. <laughs> there was a lot of good stuff there. Sorry, I just I just thought about the uh I can't think of the name, the World War II movie that was just one long take. <laughs> Oh, 1917? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say Russian Ark? Wait, no. Uh, Birdman? No. <laughs> I almost picked um, one of the, uh, I think it was Fast Five, Fast Six, the one where they steal- They blend together. They it's steal fun. the car. You and I actually, fast. I think it also takes place in the Burj Khalifa, but they steal the car and they have to get it out of there. So to escape, oh, they, they drive the car the out of the building and into the next building, and they just keep going so they can get the chip out of the vehicle. And it's, I, I mean, granted, was, that's CGI, but still. Yeah, mm. it might not have been the Burj Khalifa, but it definitely was in Dubai. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about almost, my almost was the uh, the, the, the parachuting tank sequence in the new A-Team movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not yeah. the parachuting sequence in Fast Seven where they drop six cars out of the vehicle or out of a plane. Oh boy, I, I have I have not watched the Fast movies since Tokyo Drift. Uh, we should do a, like a charity marathon episode sometime where we just watch all ten Fast movies. Can we watch them fast? Quick, we'll watch <laughs> well, them at, the same at time. once, four times speed. <laughs> no, no, just we watch These them are the once, fastest. all at the same time. Fast and the Furious, Man Who Fell to Earth edition, where it's just 10 monitors, 10 films. So. The problem is as soon as they come out with another one, it's going to break that ratio. And then you just, you can't have an even number of screens to make it work out. Yeah, we got to upgrade to two. We have to start a Patreon. <laughs> my my runner up was just John Wick, the first movie, the entire <laughs> movie. I mean, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. I still like going back. I, I still have to see four, but I loved all of them. There's still some acting and not from Keanu from um, the dog. Uh, I think Dean Winter, um, who plays like the henchman who is kind of associated to the main bad guy. But he always just seems like he does not belong with the rest of the film because he's the one who plays like mayhem in the car insurance commercials. And he was on 30 Rock. Oh, and it's yeah, just yeah. like his reactions to things and his line deliveries feels like you walked in off a different set and somebody was just like, oh, you're in a John Wick action movie now. And he's just kind of like trying to feel his way out the rest of the film. <laughs> and it throws me off for all of the action sequences. Yeah, I remember him and being in a Rescue Me way back when. And Oh, it, oh that's that's a callback. Yeah, that's where I recognize him from. And he was always whenever he was on screen on Rescue Me, it was like a highlight. So ever since then, whenever I see him, it sucks on how like he's just known as mayhem at this point from the car commercials. Mm -hmm. But every time I see him, I'm like, oh, yeah, you finally got like something good going on instead of just acting on TV. Yeah. So good. But I feel he's a uh, potential that's lost. Uh, so that wraps up a new episode of Rule of Thirds for action set pieces. As always, you can reach us at Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Screen Refresh or shoot an email at screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three would be or any topics you'd like to hear us discuss. Also, we now have a Discord. Come on over and chat with us and get behind the scene tidbits on your favorite episodes. And uh, Nick, do you have any anything you want to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> so David... What do you have going on over there at the uh, Screaming Brain? Well, Nick, it's so kind of you to ask. <laughs> uh, so at the Screaming Brain, we are a, a an indie a board and card game publisher. Um, you can find us at thescreamingbrain.com, the Screaming Brain at uh, TikTok, uh, and the Screaming Brain at Instagram. Uh, and we're actually uh, announcing we're we've got something that's been in the works for a little bit of, for a little bit that's kind of gone through some iterations. Um, but we're really excited for an upcoming project uh, that is uh, called Tic-Tac-Toe Underlords. It is a two-player combat game that takes the classic mechanics of Tic-Tac-Toe and mixes it with card-based TCG-style combat. Uh, so if you follow us at any of those places or come check us out, you can expect to see more and hear more of that, about that game as it develops. So that is it for us. So for Tim, myself, and Nick, uh, you have a great week now. 
and you can catch us on Screen Refresh the first Monday of the month. You can also listen to our sister podcast, Don't Open This Podcast, hosted by our own resident, Tim, and Mike Falsigno, every second and fourth Monday of the month. Metal Gear. Metal Gear. Metal Gear. <laughs>